One of the challenges we've had to struggle with over the course of the last 11 weeks is defining the words that we use. We have 149 students in this class, and with me, 150 different unique perspectives, history, and background uh, related to the topics of the class. And when I use the word conflict, it is clearly different than when some other students in the class that might think about international conflict, interpersonal conflict, political conflict. And so in this class, what we've focused on, what I've tried to focus on every week, is making sure that we have concrete definitions related to the topics that we are, we're talking about. And so for today, the, um, the broader kind of framework I want to bring in back from week one, and that in your writing, I would encourage you to think about for your own final papers for the students who are taking the class, is connecting the de definitions of what we talk about to the broader goals that we bring to the topics when we're trying to get something out of it, when we're doing social science, when we're writing a paper, when we're trying to understand the world. And I mentioned back in week one that I, I see four goals for research um, in political science or related to these topics. And I know that I have student, some students within the School of Politics and International Relations in which a lot of this is old hat and you do focus on description and explanation. But then we also have students coming from uh, other parts of uh, the ANU or with a different motivation in trying to understand these topics uh, in focusing on predictions and policies. And in this class, I've tried to put the focus on description and explanation to try to understand why and how these things are happening in order to try to develop the kind of policies that we're going to be talking about today and next week, as well as the potential predictions for what's likely to happen in the future. And the readings in this class that, that talk about policy and prediction, those by um, Salayan, Gledich, and others, talk about how from Barack Obama to people down the street that there's a, a perception that larger environmental changes uh, related to the climate are going to have destabilizing effects related to policies and individual lives. But in order to get there, the, the readings and I think our perspective, uh, our take in this class is focusing on descri describing what happened and then explaining why it happened in that particular way. And it, it might seem obvious as to when a conflict starts or ends or what the factors that might be related to it um, or just what a conflict is. The, the, one of the readings for this week really pushed back on that kind of quantitative comparative approach that we've read a lot of over the course of this term. And I do want to recognize and stress that there are no perfect definitions that cover all kinds of outcomes. The world is an incredibly complex place. All we can do is try to make explicit the assumptions of what goes into the descriptions that we're making and the explanations that we have for what actually happened. And to be able to define, like with a Collier and Hoffler reading back in week two, how we see the decisions being made and what goes into those decisions. But this is often uh, un, uh, imperfect, right? And so this makes me think of the oldest tree on record, the uh, Methuselah in um, in California, on the way up through the center part of the uh, part of the state, absolutely gorgeous uh, part of. Uh, part of California, I keep coming back to California, it has a lot of these kind of oversized uh, causes and effects that that I, I think uh, connect to a lot of the literature, as well as my own personal experience. But um, in uh, these, it's a bristle cone pine, uh, one of the trees in, around the world that can last uh, the longest, along with the redwoods uh, outside of uh, San Francisco. Current estimates have it at uh, over 4,700 years old, and it's a great basin bristol cone pine. And so some, according to the definition of what a tree is and how long it lasts, this would be a picture of what the oldest living thing in the world is. 
Of course, if you come up with potentially different definitions uh, as to what is a tree, for example, you might come up to different conclusions. Is the tree just the part that you see that reaches above the ground? Does that make a tree or is the root system uh, the foundations upon which everything else depends? Should that potentially be also considered a tree? Because if so, then maybe this tree system in Sweden, old Jiko, I'm murdering the pronunciation, uh, is a root system for Norway spruce that is almost 10,000 years old, 9,550 years old. So if you considered a tree, not just the root system and what's above the ground, but you take just a part of it, then potentially this is what we'd consider to be the old, oldest living thing in the world. However, you, you have other competitions depending on how you consider um, what is an individual and what is a group. So in, um, in Utah, there's a, a pendo, which is a quaking aspen colony that is up to 80,000 years old. So you have uh, multiple um, bits of a larger organism popping up through the ground. Some parts of it might fall off and die. Others are, are created, right? Similar to lizards that lose their tail. If, if they get scared or if they're caught, they can regrow another tail. Um, does that mean that it is a, a fundamentally a new creature? How much can be replaced before it's, uh, it's considered uh, something new? And I think this is just one example that occurs to me that's uh, when we think about defining our terms, we have to be explicit and it's useful to define it so that we can make sure that you as the writer or as the speaker and others as the audience can come uh, to some understanding about what's being talked about and the costs and benefits of whatever definition you come up with. So how do we respond to environmental challenges and change? As I mentioned before, through mitigation or adaptation. So let's spend a, a bit of time talking about what these terms actually mean. And uh, one uh, of the US reports talk about the importance of mitigation and adaptation. Um, the focus has moved from is climate changing to can society manage unavoidable changes and avoid unmanageable changes. Um, adaptation and mitigation are closely linked. Adaptation efforts will become more difficult, more costly, and less likely to succeed if significant mitigation actions are not taken. So these two things are, we're going to define them separately, but the mitigation efforts can flow directly into how, to, how much adaptation is actually needed uh, going forward. And so it depends on the time frame you're looking at, how you define what the actions are, and uh, how they might interact with each other. So with mitigation, uh, it is efforts to reduce or prevent an undesirable outcome. This photo comes from the early stages of the pandemic in, in 2020. Um, multiple levels of face mask shows an effort to try to reduce or prevent an undesirable outcome, getting sick. Uh, and mitigation efforts, of course, could be related to a whole bunch of undesirable outcomes that we've talked about in the class, from uh, droughts to famine to natural, natural uh, resource um, destruction or exploitation in ways that can increase corruption. So what are mitigation efforts to reduce or prevent that? Related to natural resources, I mentioned, you can develop international efforts to increase transparency or to regulate the, the market. We're gonna talk about international efforts next week, um, but the goal is the same, to try to reduce or prevent a bad thing from happening and it can be mitigation efforts can be at the individual level, the local level, national level, or international level. So um, these can relate to, <clears throat> excuse me, government policy, markets, or individual behavior to encourage new technologies, improve older technologies to prevent <coughs> environmentally um, detrimental effects to human behavior couple of examples here that uh, uh, related to um, my experience when, when trying to think about these issues. Um, reduce waste and inefficiency in agricultural production. 50% of food uh, produced is lost and not consumed. That is a huge amount of waste and you can mitigate 
the detrimental effects of agricultural production through trying to reduce uh, reduce that waste and it could also help prevent the types of scarcities that we've talked about uh, in this class so far. Uh, another way is to reduce dependence on non-renewable resources and energy and transport by helping to shift to renewable resources. We're going to be talking a bit about that a bit later on, but just take that first example of agricultural production. Um, it is it, it is one of those ongoing large structural issues that can be addressed at uh, different ways, either through uh, government regulations, through farmers' practices, through shipping and uh, market mechanisms for the corporations that bring everything to the market and us making decisions about how much we buy and why. There are different ways of trying to mitigate this amount of uh, waste. In the U.S., there's a there's a big freegan movement in uh, at least the west coast of the U.S. where I'm from, in which people try to um, reduce waste through like gum tree postings of trying to reuse things that other people don't need anymore, uh, or through um, through things that are that are thrown away um, because they're near the expiration date or they're not seen as as visibly attractive. This is not unique to the U.S. Here's an example of uh, freegans in um, Singapore uh, to uh, to Australia as well. There's been reports. Uh, I haven't seen that much around lately. Um, this one back from 2017 about whether you would dumpster dive for your meals. Some some supermarkets don't want to be held liable for them, and I've actually seen locks on some of the uh, the dumpsters to be able to prevent these things. But then there's also systematic efforts by some large corporations to try to reduce their waste by by donating to Oz Harvest or other kinds of nonprofits that will be able to redistribute some of the resources that they couldn't sell. Um, there's also a movement towards ugly produce uh, in order to try to sell some of the things that others might not want because they might not look as attractive but that they still taste and have the same nutritional value from carrots to strawberries. Um, there's uh, costs and benefits to this kind of uh, approach in the Atlantic wrote an interesting um, uh, article about the costs and benefits of trying to to encourage consumption of um, uh, produce that might not otherwise uh, be sold. So those those that's one example of mitigation, uh, reducing food waste by trying to uh, use up things that might otherwise uh, be thrown away, decay, and end up um, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. The next element is adaptation, a definition that I take from uh, the UN, adjustments in ecological, social, or economic systems in response to actual or expected climate stimuli and their effects or impacts. It refers to changes in processes, practices, structures to moderate the potential damages or to benefit from opportunities associated to climate change. Um, so this is... Uh, more that you can't change the fact that you're going to hit the iceberg, but how can you try to adapt to that situation by trying to find the nearest lifeboat or to try to steer the ship away uh, from it, but how can you try to adapt? And that process usually has a life cycle to it through observing what's likely to happen, assess uh, assessment and your vulnerability to it, uh, and your risk tolerance for, for that vulnerability, plan and implement, and then moder um, uh, monitor and evaluate uh, whether your actions are effective or not. You can also turn it into a path diagram. You know that I'm a fan of those. This is the UN's uh, adaptation cycle in which you try to um, start like at the top, assess impacts, vulnerabilities, and risks, raise awareness, plan for adaptation, implement, monitor, and evaluate. And then that turns into uh, a recurring kind of effort. It's, it's a recurring cycle. And there's a bunch of different examples that I can, I can use depending on what your area is. These might be relevant or not. Uh, adding green roofs to Australian city, uh, cities should reduce flooding and save on uh, bills, uh, energy bills. This is a way to try to uh, 
both potentially, I guess, uh, adapt as well as to um, mitigate some of the potential longer term effects. But if the world is changing, like with the Siberian uh, methane explosions from the video before this one, there are also ways to try to adapt to potentially earn a living using um, the different environment that's, that's cropping up. Uh, one example that I found that connected to uh, to Siberia was that of the ground thawing and um, corpses of animals that have been alive back when uh, before the land froze are now being um, being brought out and now there's a there's a market for uh, mammoth tusks as elephant tusks have become more regulated and constrained due to their uh, to the damaging effects of poaching. Mammoth tusks might have some similar characteristics, but you don't have to worry about um, making mammoths extinct because they already are. So mitigation, adaptation. The third um, part of the stool is understanding ri what risk is, a function, a function of the potential impact of an event and the likelihood of it occurring. This should make us uh, think about the Collier and Hoffler cost-benefit calculation of what the costs and benefits are depends on the risk of that outcome actually occurring, which in the Collier and Hoffler case would be winning the war. Um, for this um, teenager, it would be the chance of falling off the top of a building. Um, risk, uh, risk can increase the vulnerability and decrease the resilience of a community. And vulnerability is in turn usually understood as a function of exposure to change, sensitivity to change, and a community's capacity uh, to adapt and to change. This is taken from one of the readings for this week. So risk can increase vulnerability and uh, decrease uh, resistance. Of course, different um, people will come up with different definitions of risk. And some risk might pay off, right? So these... Um, these uh, teenagers that climb uh, high buildings, one of them created a NFT series that are now going for uh, over 100, uh, 100 ETH. Um, in other ways, the larger kind of systemic risks can't necessarily be benefited from in the same way and can uh, flood our kind of adaptive capacity. Um, day after tomorrow, God, that came out in 2004, showing the kind of dramatized effect on widespread uh, rapid natural disasters or uh, climatic change. I also want to highlight the difference between perceived and actual risk. This is a factor that I think has been increasingly relevant with the current pandemic in trying to understand and people's uh, ability to try to mitigate uh, uh, m mitigate their situation or adapt to it due to the um, differences in understanding what the actual relative risk is compared to different things. This uh, infographic is from uh, the Gates Foundation's annual, lever, uh, annual letter in which it helped to justify a huge increase in the spending to try to, uh, to develop a cure for malaria. Um, and so you see in the bottom the, the, the deadliest animal is not, is not the shark uh, at the top of the graph, but the humble mosquito due to the spreading of um, diseases, uh, including uh, malaria. Humans are the second deadliest, snakes, dogs, tsetse flies, um, I had never heard of the assassin bug, but I had heard of uh, Chagas getting down to the larger um, land mammals like uh, hippos and elephants and lions. Uh, but it is those uh, differences between perceived and actual risk that be that is that is crucial to try to get your head around because it can shape the kind of policies and how you try to uh, allocate spending if you are uh, at an individual, local, national, international level trying to to mitigate uh, or to adapt to uh, to changes um, in the in the larger environment that you're faced with. So who are the relevant actors? Um, individuals in the household, community, local governments, private business in the market, regional governments like the ACT and national government. Number of different examples that I could think of. I'm sure you can come up with a lot of examples from the readings, from the videos, or just from your own experience. Uh, deep well, uh, water well project in Nepal related to the 
the Dang case study from the assigned reading for this week. Solar stoves sold to Dvorian uh, refugees in Chad, so you don't have to use the scarce um, charcoal or wood to be able to, to boil water to make food. You can use and harness the power of the sun. Cap and trade level uh, efforts would be like at a state level, California, uh, or uh, some uh, northeastern states who have a more regional cap and cap and trade system in the U.S. to try to to try to um, respond to humans' impact on the climate by trying to reduce that overall impact. Carbon tax in British Columbia, one of the highest in the world, uh, or the D National Disaster Management Authority in Pakistan connecting to the natural disasters that we talked about in the Indus River Valley in Pakistan in 2010 from last week. Um, and that kind of leads me to how we can connect this to our own experience. The first lecture question for today, can you think or find online one concrete example of a climate change mitigation or adaptation effort from the town, city, or state that you're from? Um, and to try to be con uh, concrete about who the primary actor is, what they're trying to do, and what the outcome they're trying to to mitigate or to adapt to. I really enjoyed over the course of the term hearing about your own personal experiences and connections to the issues. And I would encourage you to to um, to put your comments below in the video if you're not uh, taking my class or respond uh, on Waddle under lecture note one. So that brings me to the end of this brief defining our terms, mitigation, adaptation, and risk. Now I'll start in the next section talking about the observation and assessment part of that climate uh, mitigation and adaptation cycle and connecting it specifically to the Australian case. So let's go ahead and turn to that now.